Thank you very much for the introduction. I think everyone can hear me. I speak really loud, so if I uh, bust your eardrums out, I, I do apologize in advance. I was really disappointed uh, there were no jokes this morning. Um, I, I have an excellent UDP joke. Uh, however, chances are most of you won't get it. For the nerds that laugh to that, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So I'm here to talk about uh, offensive cyber operations metadata. Um, and how we can use this for defensive posturing and analytics. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, so I, I didn't really get great grades. Um, I, I, I really don't run anymore unless, uh, you know, they put like a new tray out at Golden Corral. Maybe I'll run to that. But um, what, what I'm passionate about is, is cyber. And uh, for my civilian time uh, as a government civilian uh, and my active duty time in the Navy, uh, it, it was um, the, the best job I've ever had. So why am I up here? Well, I believe in this mission. Uh, and, and for those of you that are in this room that contribute to this mission day in, day out, I applaud you. Uh, I did it myself. Thank you very much um, for your service. If you're thinking about getting into this, uh, if you're in academia and you're thinking about coming over to uh, a, a cybercom or, or army or, or whatever service uh, to, to join the fight, um, you know, please uh, make a conscious deci decision to do that, uh, and, and I hope you do. A couple objectives. Uh, so we want to understand the value of offensive cyber operational data uh, to build, improve, and to fortify our defensive cyber landscape within our own networks. Um, I also want to, to stress that we need to better appreciate the value added to defensive cyber operations uh, when consuming non-intelligence metadata from offensive cyber operations. And lastly, highlight the importance of fostering these relationships between the defensive side and the offensive side, um, because that's how we're going to be successful. General Fogarty said stovepipes. Uh, I was thinking silos. I like stovepipes. There's a fire going in there. They're, they're, they're on fire. Yeah, I'm, I'm cool with stovepipes too, but whatever you want to call it. We need, to, we need to have it all, uh, all together. Back in the day. So what did cyber look like in 1983? Uh, and I'm going to pick on the general here. I believe you were commissioned, sir, 1983? So when General Fogarty, this, uh, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not fluffing too much here, uh, amazing leader, very intelligent man, has a very, very important, uh, important job. But well, what did cyber look like when when he was a young officer learning about warfare, learning how to leverage warfare. January 1983, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Apple Lisa computer. Uh, back in 1983, this thing was 9,995 bucks. It's roughly 24,000 in 2016. My cell phone that costs $300 has 4,000 times the amount of memory than this thing. That uh, the pizza box sitting on top, that was a, a whopping five megabyte hard drive. <laughs> We're never going to fill five meg, right? <laughs> so a couple weeks ago, I was listening to uh, Vice Admiral Ted Branch talk. Uh, he's the director of Naval Intelligence. And he was talking about how the US has a very impressive quick reaction force. Uh, we can have boots on the ground in a, a very short amount of time globally. Um, but, but the point he made was leveraging cyber, he says, you know, the, the effect can be delivered, the, the cyber war can be started and finished before boots are even off the ground, before the planes are in the air. I would like to say that the effect can be delivered and the war could be over before the boots are even laced. 33 years later, here we are. The internet will kill you. Everything is bad. Everyone's listening to you in the bathroom. Who, who knows, right? Uh, this is ridiculous. Um, you know, cyber is, a, is, a, is an amazing capability, and, and to leverage that for the warfighter and decision makers, definitely something we have to do. I mean, we must. There, there is no choice. Excuse me. So offensive cyber operations visualized. So back in the day when, when the CAV had horses and uh, the army said, hey, we these, these sweet tanks and, and you can launch stuff out of it. Yeah. 
Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of the, the, the cav officers were like, how am I going to use a tank? Like, pff, I do, we're, we're cool with horses. We've been using horses, right? The Navy, the same thing. We start putting ships on airplanes. They're like, oh, sorry, airplanes on ships. Do we have ships on airplanes? We should do that. I'm patenting that. <laughs> I'll underbid everybody else for that idea. Um, but, but do we really need a pitcher? So when I first started, uh, you know, here's a, here's an, a very powerful uh, naval uh, warfare presence. Uh, you know, they, they said offensive cyber operations, you have the operator who's the pilot. You have an analyst who's the, who's the co-pilot. Uh, we have a compliance piece, infrastructure, support operations. Uh, and also, I just want to come back to, yes, there is a compliance piece. Um, but is, is that the image that decision makers need to have? Do they need to think, okay, cyber is an airplane. Let me deliver uh, some sort of air effect. I think not. So <laughs> I came over to uh, uh, Fort Gordon, um, and, and I heard, oh, no, it's, it's not an airplane, it's a tank. Um, and this is the most realistic army tank picture I could find. I don't know if this is... <laughs> Being a Navy vet, this seemed... I was like, okay, that's a tank. Um, but, you know, the same kind of thing, right? You have an operator, you have your analyst, support operations, compliance and oversight, your maintainers. Do we really need a pitcher? Do we need a pitcher for the leadership to be able to leverage cyber? Um, it, it, it appears we do. And I propose that if we need a pitcher uh, to visualize cyber operations in the offensive capacity, that we say cyber looks like that. <laughs> Some evil Easter bunny that's running around in your networks, uh, chewing on your wires, clogging up your intertubes. This is what offensive cyber looks like. Now, can we defend against one of these? Okay. We can do that. Um, what about a couple more of his friends? You know, one of these things, uh, you know, munching on some clovers out in the field, not so bad. You get more of these, it turns into a, a, a Hitchcock movie, right? So are we confident we can defend against one? What about thousands? What about thousands? And thousands delivered at the same time. And I feel like we can. We need to understand what this animal is. And using offensive cyber operations metadata, um, we, can, we can better do that. So as I was putting together the slides, I was like, all right, cool. I have all these, these awesome tank pictures. Um, let's, let's see what, uh, what, what defensive cyber operations, what, what, if I could visualize that, what's the current stereotype? <laughs> and I'm sorry. That's just how it is. This needs to change. We should have that crazy bang, bloody mouth Easter bunny on both sides of the fence here uh, because cyber is one, one thing. It needs to move in, in the same direction. We can't have two different silos going in different directions. We need to work together because that's how we're going to win this fight and maintain the United States' superiority in this domain. So like I said, data about this wild animal. Anytime we operate an offensive capability or offensive threat uh, profile, we create metadata. Now, uh, usually, if let's say we have a collection operation, uh, you know, information is gathered to use for decision makers and policy makers at higher levels. Um, but there, there are other not so not so glamorous details: XML data, text. There, there's a trail of how we got in, what we did, um, and it's and it just kind of hangs out and, and doesn't go anywhere. No intelligence value. So what is metadata? Very simply. Data that provides information about other data. Okay. What am I saying OCO metadata is? This is data that provides information about OCO tactics, techniques, and procedures. How we did what we did. So a couple sources. Red teaming. Continuous vulnerability assessments. Uh, penetration testing of our own networks. Uh, we have this uh, historical technical data that provides us with trend analysis. Uh, static attack methodologies. Um, we can also gain valuable metrics on how our current defenses are implemented um, and our active defense response times uh, when there is an alert or, or whatnot. Another source is uh, the Cyber Mission Forces uh, Range Ops. So this is observable force readiness uh, from a multitude of angles for leadership. 
Uh, one of the best things, you know, this is our proving ground. One of the best things, it provides for opportunistic le uh, learning opportunities. Leadership can come in, they can interject, they can make changes on the fly to make sure that our capability is being uh, proven in its, its best scenario. And lastly, there's the offensive cyber operations magic. This is the, this is the CSI cyber cool stuff. No, it's, it's really not that glamorous. Um, but this is uh, active warfighter support, tailored capabilities. Um, this metadata provides leadership with insight into what does a refined actor look like? What does refined tradecraft really look like? And we don't have, we can't get that source anywhere else, but we created ourselves, why are we not using it? So OCO metadata, it's exploit vectors. How the offensive teams got into said network. Uh, Counterintelligence, uh, like the general said, there are a lot of actors in cyberspace. We cohabitate with a lot of, uh, with a lot of actors, whether we want to or not. Um, and this is valuable counter intel that we can hand to the defensive side uh, so they know what to look for uh, instead of waiting until the alerts start firing. Incident response mitigation tactics. So using offensive cyber, uh, cyber operations metadata for IR mitigation, um, best case scenario, you're not caught offensively, right? But what if you are? Um, what, uh, what are the defenders uh, in our adversaries' networks doing to catch us? And can the defensive teams employ those same tactics? What works, what doesn't work? Uh, in our own defensive networks. And lastly, in-house threat intel. Uh, on the private sector side, uh, we meet with a lot of clients at Rendition InfoSec uh, that have uh, threat intelligence cell, uh, they have their security operations center, uh, and they pay big money for these threat intelligence feeds. Basically, a list of what's bad. Look for this, look for that, all of this is bad, uh, and, and pay us, you know, give us a check. We have in-house threat intel that no one else can possess, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's sitting there. Socio metadata, what it isn't. So it's not a tool specific. This isn't, uh, hey, defensive team, if you see an ICMP packet that's pretty large, go to the 29th uh, you know, offset, look for hex value 29, bam, that's your, no. It's, it's not how we're doing things. It's a very generic overview. Uh, what, what it isn't, again, is targeted network information. Uh, it's not the actual target. Uh, it's just a generic overview of uh, maybe what sort of target it was, whether it's a military target, et cetera. Uh, it's also not granular operation details, not the who, the what, the why, the when, the how. Uh, it's just the, uh, the, the meat and potatoes of how we got in, how we didn't get in, where we persisted, where we did not. Um, and then to highlight, it's not report worthy. You know, this big bin of data comes into an analysis cell, the intelligence goes over here, the rest of it goes over there. Um, it's, it's very easy to, uh, to add another bin uh, in the current analysis cells and, and drop some of this in there to feed to the uh, defensive teams. So like I said, return on investment. This is dynamic and sustainable data. Uh, threats are constantly changing, constantly evolving, um, and, and we can feed that in in real time to our defensive teams. Uh, it costs us nothing, uh, so we can't say, well, budget, you know, we don't have enough money. Um, it's, it's free, uh, and we should be using it. Uh, to reiterate, in many cases, uh, it's non-intelligence. It's, it's relatively sanitized. It does not have to be specific to a target set uh, or anything like that. And like I said, it utilizes current analysis cells. Uh, data is already sifted by, uh, by a group of very intelligent, highly trained people uh, that uh, know what the intel is and, and, and what is junk. Um, and just take another look at the junk. That's all, I'm, that's all I'm saying here. So DCO, yeah, them again. So newsflash, uh, defense really matters. Um, and that's an offensive guy saying that. So I, think I'm, I don't think I have a fever yet, but defense matters. We need to get this right. Um, it, you can't have the rock stars on the OCO side and then uh, everyone that didn't make it to be a super uber hacker for CSI Cyber uh, to be a defender. They're very talented people on both sides. This is what we currently have. This is my corner of the sandbox. These are my toys. Don't touch them. I'm doing my mission. You do your mission. Leave me alone. I'll leave you alone. Um, you know, the defensive side, maybe there's some cool trucks I want to play with, you know? 
Um, we need to share. We need to communicate. Um, and, and this sandbox of computer networks operations, you know, it's, th there's plenty of room there. So lateral sharing. Offensive value uh, to DCO is uh, advanced defense posturing. Um, by studying advanced uh, exploitation uh, and attack paths, you can make a more, defense, uh, more advanced defensive posture in your own network. Real world analytics, uh, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't fake, this isn't made up. These are live operations or uh, range operations or continuous, uh, continuous monitoring uh, on the red team side. Defend like a hacker. So one of my first jobs at Rendition, I walked into a client, 500,000 computers, 500,000. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty large network. Um, they, they had an actor in the network, a uh, well-known actor. Uh, they were everywhere. Um, I talked to the, the guy that was leading the incident response, and he said, if you were planning this attack offensively, where would you be? And I said, well, I would be in your routers, I'd be in your switches, I'd be in that Linux server that you haven't rebooted since 1979. Um, I will be in your, uh, your IP phones sitting on the conference desk and, and just hanging out and waiting for the incident to be over. And he said, whoa, we're not looking there. The appropriate response was, I know, I know. Uh, counter intel, um, offensive uh, operational data to defensive side um, is, is just, uh, the counter intel value is, is huge. We can, uh, from, from studying how we cohabitate and what we see in cyberspace on the offensive side, uh, we can tip, tip the ha hand to the uh, defensive side a little bit so they can, they can be looking uh, a little more deeply in, uh, into you know, what their current alerts are. Data we can't buy. Cross-platform understanding. On the offensive side, I would love I would have loved it if I had a defender that could sit side saddle. Even a defender that, I could, that was on watch, that I could pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing X, Y, Z, what do you think? Maybe they'd say, hell, I'd never, I'd never even look for that. Maybe they'd say, oh, oh yeah, that would fire an alert right away. Um, that's valuable, that is extremely valuable. Uh, and defense auditing, what works, what doesn't work, uh, we can adjust that in real time, uh, consuming offensive data. Uh, there's also value um, on the offensive side of DCO, like I said, uh, previous, prior to the slide that I meant to say it, um, you know, it, it would be awesome to have a defender sitting side saddle. This allows for advanced offense development. On the fly, we can change how we do things uh, to be more successful. Uh, better cohabitation. Um, we don't want to look in a network like a nation state. We don't want to look like the U.S. military. Um, we don't want snort rules created by Doug Burks that says this is cybercom. Um, we, we want to blend in. Uh, and having the defensive uh, data on the offensive side readily available uh, allows us to better cohabitate and blend in. Hack like a defender. Um, there are some ma amazing cyber capabilities, just mind blowing. Um, and there are also some very, very simple ones. Uh, <laughs> Nothing is completely proprietary, uh, or if it is, it isn't for very long. Um, so hacking like a defender, um, you, what the defenders catch, what they see in their networks, the threats that they mitigate, uh, maybe the offensive side is doing the same thing, maybe we need to change it up a little bit, uh, maybe someone's doing re something really slick that we haven't thought of. Um, and again, I have no case studies for that uh, because of the forum, but I think you get my point. More robust IR mitigation. So on the offensive side, we don't know that we're caught until we're caught. Um, and, and having a, a defender there to be able to feed data in, uh, we can better alert ourselves uh, ahead of being caught. Safer TTP augmentation. What I mean by that is uh, um, we can adjust on the fly. A defender says, hey, don't do this uh, specific technique. We're, you, you could get caught. We can change it on the fly and be more successful. Just like the last slide, cross-platform understanding. Offensive side needs to know what the defender is thinking. The defender needs to know what the offensive side is thinking. Um, and offense auditing. Yes, yes. 
work together. That's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, it needs to happen. It needs to happen. So to summarize, sharing is caring. Share your toys. Share your sandbox. Um, optimization in cyberspace, in the cyber domain, requires dynamic collaboration. Um, we need to develop and nurture those lateral relationships. Consume the data. Uh, there are a lot of excellent byproducts. Not all of those are intelligence uh, or report worthy um, from uh, uh, conducting uh, cyber operations in an offensive role in any threat role. Um, we, need to, uh, we need to consume that data. And last thing, enable advanced posturing. Enable yourselves to defend your network the best you can. You don't want to be the slobbering dog on the defensive side. We need uh, scary, scary creatures on both sides to remain supreme, to remain superior in this warfare domain. So many parts of OCO, but the biggest takeaway is we are this creature. You may be able to defend against one. We may be able to defend against five. What about thousands? Um, and not using this data that helps us understand this and helps us to understand how this creature evolves uh, is imperative. Um, and uh, the data's there. Leadership, you just have to go out and grab it. You have to turn it into uh, a non-intelligence um, threat feed that uh, your defenders are looking at uh, and then cross-pollinate on both sides. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attentiveness. Uh, do I have time for? Oh, there's no time for questions? OK. Oh, no, I heard. No. Yes? As part of your um, sharing, have you also looked at them moving back and forth, you know, exchanging, working on an often, uh, a largely offensive experience, working on Defender and vice versa? And do you find that an effective method of? of improving sharing between the teams? So uh, I think that you have, um, you know, General Ford, we talked about talent. Talent's a big issue in the government and on the, in the private sector. Um, you have very talented defenders, extremely talented defenders, and if they are okay where they're at and, and they, they like that shell, don't force them to move. I think um, I see a lot or, or had seen a lot in the military and on the, uh, on the national and on the cybercom side. Um, you know, I understand there are quotas and you need to put certain people in certain areas uh, and we all have, uh, you know, manning, um, manning requirements. But if you have a defender that loves their job and they're effective and they're doing a, a phenomenal job at that, let them hang out. If you have a defender that says, I would really think that I can be effective on the offensive side, let them do it. You know, it's up to the leadership to figure out how that is worked out. Um, but you see a lot of people that are stagnant, you know? On the offensive side, it's, it's a cool job, but there are a lot of people that are like, man, I just want to watch packets all day. You know, I, I don't want to be thinking about this stuff anymore. So hopefully that answered somewhat of what you're saying. But um, yes, I think that uh, cross-pollination needs to happen. There needs to be lateral movement between both sides. Uh, but I believe that uh, forcing it down anyone's throat is just uh, a, a bad idea. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Hang out right here for a second. Hang out right here for a second. <clears throat> Hang out. Awesome. So that was great. And luckily, <clears throat> you had at least one question. We promise to get harder questions in the future. And in fact, I'll, we'll, we'll come up with some really good ones over the break and make sure they like mob you outside okay. with all the really hard ones. Can when I keep the, the, can I keep the laser pointer? Or? No, you, you can't I'm, keep I'm the laser. doing this wrong because I'm yeah, firing you can't keep the laser pointer. But what I do want to give Brandon, because what, what a great talk and what a great uh, idea that we all need to be thinking about. I want to present with him the very coveted Army Cyber Institute Cyber Talks Black Badge of Excellence. Um, it's, it's very awesome. It's, it's numbered. You are number 38. Very few people have earned the right for a black badge, and we really want to thank you very much for your presentation and work thank today. You. Thank you Thanks. very much. I appreciate it.